Hi, Brian. Hello, Frank. How are you doing? How are you? Yeah, I'm the full thing. I, um, you know, like just uh, before jumping on this call, I, I, I watched um, an old video we did together, which was, uh, I think, around COVID. So two, three years ago, two years ago, where we ended by saying maybe the solution would be to go camping, to sing, to do a choir. And maybe that's, that's what a political program should be. Um, but, but thinking about it now, with all the shit that's happening, and I think we've, I mean, I've never experienced that level of shit before. Um, I'm wondering if camping and singing is, is going to be enough. I think we, we're going to have to think about other, other ways to, um, in a way, fight um, the rise of fascism um, all over the world. Because, you know, what's happening in Gaza is part of it, the rise of, of fascism. Um, well, how have you felt in the last eight months? Uh, pretty impotent, actually. Um, I felt frustrated because there wasn't any obvious way of doing anything other than sending money to medical aid for Palestine and things like that, uh, which obviously everybody's been doing. Um, but the the feeling that there's no political structure to call on any longer, um, that they've completely left themselves out of the process, and also the feeling that what they're doing is deliberately collapsing a lot of the international institutions. For instance, just take the American reaction to the what the International Court of Justice said. They just said, well, we're not going to recognize it. We, we won't have anything to do with it. And, you know, in the end, it's those big global agreements, sorts of consensus that keep things from going completely awful in many ways. But now we, we're supporting a country that is quite happily targeting non-combatants, medical staff, destroying schools, hospitals, universities, what moral position do we have left in the world? How can we say to any other country now doing atrocious things, you shouldn't do this, you should adhere to international standards? We aren't. We're completely off the rails there. So this is, this is I think, the big difference now, that we are in new territory in terms of international relationships, where it becomes completely obvious that uh, we support the people who are on our side and we don't bother about the people who aren't. Um, and we've seen this, of course, we've seen it covertly many times in the past, um, but now it's completely out in the open. This is not about ethics and moral standards. It's about who will win and how they'll get there. Um, it's a sort of complete breakdown of any moral fabric that that in the past, even if it often failed, even even that it did often fail, um, nonetheless there was still some sense that there were some boundaries within which we should we should operate. What I've seen coming out of Israel now is so disgusting and such a clear manifestation of state fascism. And yet my country and yours are still pretending nothing different is going on. You know, we, we've got this election cycle now in England where neither of the party of the leaders of the two major parties have even mentioned Gaza. This is amazing to me. Neither of them. You know, I could understand that the governing party, since they are signed up to support Israel, I can understand why they don't want to talk about it. But the opposition party doesn't want to talk about it either. It's an embarrassing problem, so we, we won't talk about it. It's almost as if they made an agreement behind, backstage, you know. Look, I'll tell you what, talk about anything, but let's not bring out Gaza. 
it's it's a complete national embarrassment. And and I mean what 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 you were just saying is like you know like we um I guess human beings need some kind of you know have some kind of either moral compass or have some kind of safety nets or, or things they can look um for when they in times of distress and stuff and and what I feel now and I think this is so dangerous I'm not sure what's going to come out of it but what you've just said international law doesn't apply to us uh the international criminal court doesn't apply to us arrest warrant don't apply to us uh we can randomly kill uh and I'm not talk I'm just talking about kids uh, 15 I think it's about 15,000 kids and no one cares we can kill UN staff no one cares we can kill foreigners like you know Australians no one cares and I think this is so dangerous yeah so so it's it's mad it's 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 crazy I don't have I can't find words but um yeah well it, it sort of shows you that in a sense people are not anymore thinking about the idea of a better future what they're thinking of is we're in a shit situation we're in a mess what's the best i can find for myself in all of this and i think people are doing that now on a national and a global level of saying what's what's the best deal for me how can i make things the best for myself i mean i've seen it for quite a long while in the way billionaires are um clearly entirely self-interested um, more and more and are thinking the place is going down in flames. How can I get a bigger fire engine for myself or a bigger fire shelter or something like that? Um, so, so anyway, that's the bad news. But, you know, your first question about singing and dancing and camping. <laughs> um, th there are really two ways we can go about this. One is by trying to stop the awful things that are happening. We're not doing very well on that. Um, but the other is by trying to make some good new things happen. Um, trying to build in, even if it's in quite a small way, to build a kind of future we would like to live in. And I see quite a lot of that going on. Um, and it doesn't really ever make the news. It's just not newsworthy. You know, the old adage for the newspaper industry is if it bleeds, it leads. And if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't feature. You just don't hear about it. So so I think people call me a terrible optimist for this, but I think there's there's a lot more good news than, than we know about. Um, and I, I see it, you know, I see people getting together to build things together, to make different ways of living together, different ways of reaching agreements, different forms of governance. You know, there's now... A, kind of growing movement for citizens' assemblies. I know you had a big one in France that was partly sabotaged by the fact that the government then said, and we're going to ignore everything you said at the end of it. Um, but nonetheless, they did make the exercise of saying, what would ordinary citizens think? Now, in the case of Gaza, we know that in every single country, with the possible exception of Germany, I suppose, in every single country, there is a majority of people against the war in Gaza. In some countries, it's a huge majority, like 88%, that kind of number. Um, and yet their governments are not paying attention to them. Uh, the countries that are doing anything good are smaller countries. Um, Ireland for instance, a really good example of a, of a culture that has the integrity to stand alone on something like this. Um, we've, we've lost all integrity. We're in such a weak position, we think, that we can't afford not to be friends with the Americans and with the Israelis and everybody else. Hmm. We don't have to be friends with the Palestinians because they don't have any any political clout at all so we can ignore them but anyway yeah. sorry i sorry no i mean what, what you grumbling again 
No, no, no. But it's uh, it's that's that's what you know. I guess talking is about as well. But you know, it's this kind of thinking out loud. But um, we, um, I was reading something very interesting. Um, most voters that vote far right, extreme right, um, if you ask them the question, "Do you think we can change the way the world is?" they will say no. Uh, uh, and apparently there's a huge difference between people voting on the left that still believe that, you know, there is an alternative and people in the far right don't believe there's an alternative. And that's why I think they think the way you, you said, you know, it's about me. It's, about it's not about the one next door who looks brown or black or it's about me. Um, and um, but, I mean, you but, mentioned the media. The media uh, and most people nowadays rely still on the mainstream media you know there's the elections in france as well since uh, macron decided to uh to, to call for an election um the the rise of the far right in france is scary yeah in a in an in that in in imaginable way so i've been watching the debates, you know, in, in the mainstream media. So you have, uh, you know, the, the left front now, they've, they've, you know, they've got together the, uh, the greens, the, the, what they call the radical left, which is nothing but radical, but anyway, they call it the radical left. Um, so you have these debates. Uh, I mean, most mainstream media in France, private mainstream media is clearly on the right or maybe the extreme right, you know, and, um, uh, so you got the person from the the left that talks about its its program. We want to raise minimum wages. We want to block, uh, you know, the the prices of, um, you know, the fl flour, pasta, rice. We want to, you know, tax the rich a bit more. So they will talk like quite. Some of them are very interesting, very intelligent. And then the guy will say, "But what about honestly? But what about Hamas?" And you go, "What?" And you go, "On on the October the seventh, what did you say?" And actually, you know, this, this like a fake news world. So they will say your party, like La France Insoumise, is anti-Semitic. And then you go, oh, give me any example. We've been never, uh, you know, gone to court for that. And then they go, no, 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 but that's not the point. So, yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's honestly, it drives me mad. It drives me bonkers that we let these people get away with it. And it's the same against when uh, the talk about Gaza, you know, they'll say, yes, it's too bad. There's 40,000 people. But it's Hamas's fault. They'll never, they'll never say, but there's 40,000 people dead. Hamas or not Hamas, you know, they're, they're still dying today. So the media role in this is, is, is so disgusting. Yeah. Well, it all hangs around that anti Semitism charge, you know. And I. Always. I, yeah. I think it must be. Oh. Being a liberal Jew. Being, being a Jew who doesn't support all of that and being suddenly grouped with all of these fascists essentially you know people like Bezalel Smotrich and uh, Ben Gavir um, and Netanyahu himself you know that these are straightforward fascists there's nothing that they do that is different from what fascists have always done and if if I were Jewish I would be telling everyone I'm nothing to do with them they don't represent me at all um, I think that they have contributed more to anti-semitism than than anything anybody on the left has ever done um, this sort of feeling of okay we're going to play the victim card even when we're creating victims thousands of them every day this doesn't work and people are starting to see especially young American Jews yeah. start to see this just doesn't make sense at all. So what Netanyahu has been doing and, and the extreme right has been doing in Israel has actually split the Jewish community right down the middle as well. It's it's terrible for them. And and in fact it's finished Israel in my opinion. I don't see what viable future Israel has now. It can it can only become a permanently struggling fortress with with no prospect of peace unless this that this whole government is completely swept away you know sooner or later 
quite a lot of the Jews in Israel already realize this. Quite a lot. Soon is going to be a majority. And then I, I expect a period of intense national shame. You know what happened in Germany after the war when suddenly people had to face up to the fact that they had been burning Jews. And it was them who did it. It was German people who did it. I think there's going to be that same sense of, oh my God, how did we get into this? How did we end up here? We of all people. Um, and I think that will happen quite soon and it will be a kind of like a nervous breakdown. I, I think already Israel is, is a mentally sick country. It's sort of suffering from a, a kind of psychosis, an illness, a mental illness, and it's become a national mental illness. This sometimes happens in the history of countries. You know, it, it happened, uh, it's, it's happened in so many places actually, where suddenly there's been a complete breakdown of rationality, of, of any sense of empathy. Um, and people have, you know, run pell-mell into the, into the fight ready to do whatever they were told to do and only years later have thought who was i when i did that was that me it couldn't have been me how did i end up there you know a lot of the books about europe and germany after the second world war really have that as their theme of this self-questioning of thinking how did we ever get there that's going to happen in israel for sure you know, I was um, listening to a, a talk that Gideon Levy gave, you know, so Gideon Levy, this really important journalist in Israel, one of the, the last one with Amir Ahas and a few others. Yeah. Um, and he said something very interesting. Uh, he said uh, to the crowd he was speaking to, do you know when anti-Semitism was at, 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 at its lowest in the world, in France, in Germany, in the US, uh, was when Israel was engaged in the sort of Oslo peace process. Yes. Even if we know now how rubbish Oslo was, um, when Israel engaged and tried, whatever, we know it didn't really try, but anyway, when it looked like Israel was trying to get to a peaceful solution for Palestine, anti-Semitism was at, at, at its lowest. I'm yeah. not saying, obviously, that all, the Jew, all Jews represent Israel, but that's what Israel is saying. So if yes. you're a state which says, like, we are the state of the Jews, we represent all the Jews, and then you go on genocide after genocide, obviously some people are going to think all Jews are, you know, collaborate with this. But yes. I thought it was a very interesting point from Gideon Levy. I, I'd never thought of this, that when Israel tries to have peace, there's Ooh. no anti-Semitism, or less anyway, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's also when, when Israel is trying to have war, which it often has been doing, it tells you a lot more about the amount of anti-Semitism there is. They, yeah. it, it's one of their justifications for having wars, you know. It's the way they, because they're always saying, no, 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 we're not the people committing the crimes. We're the victims. Look, it's happening all the time. There was, just the other day, there was someone in Grenoble who sprayed swastikas on a synagogue wall or something like that. So, as soon as they need the anti-Semitism defense, you will hear a lot about it because it gets publicized. And they need that defense all the time that they're trying to wage these terrible wars. It's not only the war in Gaza, that's, that's awful. But the fact is they've now handed, handled, handed all of the civil administration in the West Bank to allies of Bezal, Bezalel Smotrich, who's a, who's a fascist. You know, there's, he has absolutely stated his position. He thinks Israel should have no Palestinians in it at all. Um, they have no right to live there in his Jewish state. And now he's heading the administration of the West Bank. Well, everybody knows what that means. It's ethnic cleansing. And he'll go ahead with it. And England will keep nodding its head and saying, well, they have a right to defend themselves. And America will keep sending them weapons and uh, they'll do in the west bank exactly what they've done in gaza but with fewer bombs 
they just use rifles. So you, you know what's yeah, you know what's scary as well is that Israel, and, and the thing with Israel and its leaders, they say what they're going to do, many times. You know, so before the genocide, they were saying we're going to do a genocide, and people in the media in France said, no, of course they're not going to do a genocide, but but they're saying it. Then they keep saying it, they're doing it, but the media and and Richie Sunak said, no, no, of course they're not doing it, but they're saying it and they're doing it. So for, for years now, Israel has, has said and its leaders, we are going to redraw the map of the Middle East, meaning we're going to bomb Lebanon, we're going to bomb Syria, we're going to attack Iran. And now they're doing it. They're trying to erase Gaza and the Palestinians. They're really, you know, intending to go after Hezbollah or, or Lebanon. But this can just have so many terrible repercussions, you know, yeah. a, a global sort of Middle East war. And we are letting them do it. And it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. And I'm wondering how we can stop it. Obviously, so I was talking with Keir Stammer, Richie Sunak, or, me, or Macron, but how can we, I mean, we've, we've done demonstrations, we've gone like, but we still feel very, like useless. You yeah. Know. I, th I think, um, first of all, I think you have to recognize now that the Israeli strategy has never been to reach an accommodation with Palestinians. It's, it's always been, even when it was, when they were going through the peace process, so-called, that was still a way of advancing Israeli interests. I mean, I remember very well when one of the sets of peace talks opened about 10 years ago, maybe more. And on the very day that they opened, Israel granted 540 new settlers the right to build on Palestinian land. On the very, very day, you know, isn't this a way of saying, look, we're having this peace process, but fuck you, mate, nothing's going to come of it. As far as I can see, it suits them to be in a state of permanent war because while they're in a state of permanent war, since they're the ones with all the weapons, they can um, establish a situation that they want. It's facts on the ground, as they say in military terms. If you build a town somewhere illegally, a settlement, it's very difficult to get rid of it because then there are people involved, there are their lives, their livelihoods, their children growing up there. It's a fact on the ground, you know, so Israel has always been establishing those, certainly since 1967 anyway. And it is of no value at all to them with those ambitions to have peace. If they have peace, they'll have to stop doing that. And my, my kind of analysis of the situation now is that the reason Israel has been able to do that is because they've had support, particularly from America. So they've never had to reach an accommodation with the Palestinians. I can imagine, I could have imagined a situation where, okay, starting off with this kind of ridiculous idea that it was a country with no people for a people with no country. Well, that wasn't true to start with. The first half of that wasn't true. There were people living there. Nonetheless, you know, everybody was quite rightly, completely sympathetic to the Jews and what had happened to them in the war. And I can understand the idea of saying, let's give them a place of their own. Well, in fact, they gave them a place, but it, it wasn't just them living there. But had that been left like that, I think, without this infallible backing of America, suppose it had been the case that somehow or other, they had to reach an accommodation. We've got to come, we've, either we're just going to keep fighting all the time on relatively equal terms and never resolve it, or we have to come to some agreement with each other. I think agreement would have been reached much sooner. I'm not saying it would have been clean or easy or no blood shed or anything like that. But I'm, I'm sure it would have been reached much, much quicker than what we've seen now of this extended kind of program of ethnic cleansing now ending in this terrible uh, 
holocaust really of of um what's that's happening in gaza so i think that all of the support that we have given to israel has translated into a horror for palestinians we we think we've been supporting yeah, okay. israel but what we've actually been doing is condemning the palestinians yeah yeah and i think it's um when, when you look at like the facts um like the us and their role in this uh, the uk france germany they're not only um you know it's it's a us israel genocide you know because you, yeah. you can't do a genocide without bombs and if all the bombs pretty much are us made it's a us genocide but it's also a german genocide because the Germany has been selling weapons to, it's like the first European import, exporter of weapons to Israel. And, and then if you think of the sort of diplomatic and political backing, it, it enables Israel to get total impunity. And you know, when you have um, a bully at school, you know, uh, he's taller, he's bigger than all his friends. So, you know, during um, the break, he just slaps them in the face over and over again. If you never tell him anything, He's going to do it more and more and more and more. And yeah. that's what's happening with Israel. And when you say like it's kind of a lunatic state, I think they've turned into this lunatic bully. And my only hope is that, I mean, lunatic bullies at one point, I guess, implode or something. Because you can't, you know, they, you know, and, and, but I want you to ask you, because we're going to have to wrap up. I want you to ask you specifically, because you're an artist. You, you've been an artist for decades and you've worked with everyone, pretty much not everyone, but a lot of really, really good uh, artists, musicians. And uh, we um, have been um, happy to see new people come on board. And I, I hate to say come on board because it's, it's just about humanity. And yeah. But I've seen more people, you know, come on board and say, you know, I want to do things for Palestine. I want to do things for Gaza. And... But I've also not seen many, many people, and we know them. And there's not only one or two. There's actually many people. You know, Desmond Tutu, the you know Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who was uh, one of the hero of entire apartheid, the entire apartheid struggle, always said that you know you can't be neutral in a situation of injustice. There's no way you can be neutral in a situation of genocide. There's no way if you have a mic, if you have millions of followers, if you have millions of people coming to see, see you sing, you can say, oh, there's, you know, I don't know, but, you know, I don't know. I, I won't take a position. But a lot of artists have done that. Yeah. Uh, a lot of, how, how are you disappointed or it's, it's another feeling? Well, you know, earlier I was talking about either resisting bad things or doing good things. You can separate those in your mind. I find it difficult to separate them. <laughs> you know, I think that if, if I want to see the future, a future that is any good at all, I have to say that some things have to stop. They don't fit into that future. And in fact, they prevent that future from happening. But there are some people who, and I'm giving them as much credit I, as I can for their position, there are some people who think, I don't want to even think about the bad side. I think by thinking about it, I encourage it. So I just want to make good new things. I just want to build a new world. And, you know, there have been people who've done that successfully, but I can't remember any of them right now. <laughs> I'm sure there must be some. But, you know, people like... Um, Nick Cave, for example, who seems to me has consistently um, refused to condemn Israel for anything. Well, I suppose I could say um, he, he believes that his art is powerful enough to speak for itself and he doesn't have to express a political position. Um, I personally don't think that art is automatically good and automatically tells you the truth. Um, I think art can just as well be in the service of, of a bad master as a good master. Um, and 
I, I think that it's sort of a slightly cowardly position to say, no, I'm not going to speak out about this. We know it's a difficult thing to speak out about because as soon as you do, somebody slaps you quite hard. Um, but for Christ's sake, don't we have any courage left in this? You know, I, I really don't want to condemn other people and say, oh, they're not doing the same thing as me or they don't believe the same thing as me. But it's very hard for me to understand how this isn't an absolute outrage for everybody. If you, if you don't think this is an outrage, what would it take to make you act? What, what is an outrage if this isn't? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I'm, 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 I'm wondering, I'm trying to, you know, you, you can't get into people's head. There's a lot of, um, disinformation about Palestine. There's a lot of, um, uh, propaganda against the Palestinians. There's a lot of anti-Palestinian racism. I mean, the fact that we are still talking now, you and I, after nine months, I think pretty much of a genocide of thousands of kids being killed this morning again um i think another 42 people died next to a, a red cross um encampment or something like you know place and it's we've we've become in a way numb to it the the you know the tally goes up and up and up you know i never thought gaza is such a small place i never thought i remember during operation gas led and in 2009 i think 1400 people died and I was like 1400 out of 2 million is a lot of people now we're up to 40,000 yeah it's it doesn't it's very hard it doesn't I mean I can understand why some people would go crazy at this moment um and the fact that people would say like you know I'd rather I'd rather not speak it's not for me uh, is, is is mind-blowing but as you said I think you said it in regards to Israel but I think in I don't know in how many years, five, 10, 15 years, when people will be asked by the kids or grandkids or something, you know, hey, you had a mic at the time, you had a, a platform. Like, apparently you didn't say anything. How? Yeah. People will have to um, find a way to answer that. And I don't want to be them. I don't want to be them. But um... people, <laughs> people always find very interesting ways of answering those questions. Um, I'm sure not always very credible ways, but you know that there's. I think even if we leave aside all the ethical, moral, and sort of normal, empathetic human considerations in this, what is very important is the thing that we started with: that we're this is causing the destruction of any sense of there being an international ethical community. Yeah. It's really destroying that, and that is very bad news for the future. Forget what you think, think about Israelis or Muslims or Catholics or what the fuck else, or fascists or non-fascists. Yeah. Think about the future of the world and how we hold it together in some form or another where it isn't just completely the law of the jungle and whoever's strongest just wins and the others die. Um, that's what's really at risk now, I think. Yeah. You know, that's that's the bigger picture. And that's that's sort of the the main reason I think we've got to keep fighting this because if this isn't if this is allowed to pass without any resistance, then yeah, yeah. everything will be allowed to pass. And on that Thank cheer, you, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, I Frank. like the the other ending more, the camping and yes. the singing. But, Very nice to you know, see you. We, nice we get to, to that. To you. Same, Brian. Thank you. <laughs>